All right, let's get started. Um, so I, we've already got a couple of comments, not sure yet. Vacation is scheduled for June and encryption. Encryption, yeah, that's something on my wish list as well. Um, all right, so let's get started, guys. Uh, welcome to this training session by Quick Start. And this is your host, Etisham. I'm with jo Joseph Holbrook. Uh, Joseph is an expert in blockchain, DevOps, cybersecurity, you name it. Uh, and I think a lot of you should be very familiar with him. He's, he's also an author and instructor. He's, uh, he has uh, published a lot of courses online uh, on multiple IT domains. So uh, without further ado, uh, Joseph, take it from here. You can share your screen as well. I think we've lost your screen. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for the great introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen and get started. Now, as far as our uh, mini course today in cryptographic techniques, we're going to be focused on basically the objectives for the major exams. And this is going to be, of course, the CEH exam, the Ethical Hacker exam, Security Plus from CompTIA. And also the objectives uh, would also fit the um, certified, uh, basically, uh, actually the certified uh, security professional, the CASP, exam and also the pen test and cybersecurity analyst exams as well. It all fits into there. But also the Cisco certification around uh, security and then also a few other certs as well. But basically um, what I did is I tried to cover literally four hours and one hour for everyone. So you have all the content to really get yourself enabled and be successful, at least in this objective of any of the domains uh, that you're gonna focus on uh, around encryption that is. Now, before I get started, let's go ahead and do a quick uh, little intro and uh, let you know about myself and why I'm really good at this uh, security and encryption. Basically, I've been an IT architect for quite a while, and not to date myself, but I was in the U.S. Navy. I was an electronics technician. I did a lot of secure communications, held a top secret clearance, and uh, floated around the middle of the ocean, uh, making sure that our enemies, and even our friends for that matter, <laughs> um, our allies, as we would call them, couldn't intercept our communications. And to be fair and honest, the reality is, is that encryption <laughs> hasn't changed for 20 years. It's really the, the same thing. Uh, and that makes it really easy to teach because there's very little that's new. Um, it's just that the, what I would call the technology is, is sort of difficult at first to grasp. So I'm gonna try to do my best to make it as simple as possible. But the reality is, is that we have over a hundred slides that, uh, that are going to really get you everything you know for any IT security exam. And actually I just was looking at the Palo Alto uh, Pansert as well. And that one there, uh, pretty much, uh, you, you'd have the objectives for that around encryption as well. So you're good to go there. Now, I've also included some practice exam questions to help get you started as well. But to, to focus on the introduction and continue on and get into the content, um, basically, I've been in the blockchain and cloud arena for quite a while. Matter of fact, I've been uh, literally in the cloud computing arena using AWS and Google Cloud uh, before it was actually cool. So it, it's been quite a while. And before that, I did a lot of data architecture. So I was a pre-sales and post-sales engineer. 
for Burkid, uh, HP, for example, 3PAR, uh, Hitachi Data Systems Federal. And with that said, I, I'm really looking forward to bringing this on to everyone. I'm also a CompTIA subject matter expert in cloud as well. So I hope uh, I can bring my expertise and my training skills to get you all enabled as quickly as possible in this objectives. Now, what we're gonna cover is really focused on cryptography concepts. Now, to be fair and honest, to cover just the fir first, I guess, line item, uh, excuse me, let me get some water. And uh, it's funny because I just literally came back from the dentist three hours ago. So I had a crown put on, I still feel a little numb. So again, I uh, should be good, but anyways, just uh, letting you know. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I uh, don't recommend crowns if you don't need them, but uh, it's better than a root canal. Now, as far as cryptography, speaking of root canals, <laughs> cryptography can be very, um, what I would call boring to a lot of folks in IT. And I found that to be true for myself for many years until I got into the bits and bytes in the data flow. So I'm gonna try to bring this together as quickly as possible. The other thing about cryptography is a terminology. There's over 35 terms. For example, the security plus exam you need to know for that exam. So there's a lot of terminology to know just to get started before we get into concepts and how encryption works and what is public key encryption and cryptography. So let's go ahead and get started into what we're gonna cover. So the course itself covers essentially the majority of the cryptography objectives for the common IT security exams. Now, mainly again, it's gonna be the CompTIA Security Plus, the um, Certified Ethical Hacker, CISSP, and the Cisco Security Cert as well. So that's really the main goal, but the reality is, is that it does cover the other three CompTIA certs as well, pretty well from what I, I've seen. And um, I, again, we're good there. And also too, um, one thing to point out uh, around what we're gonna cover is that the practice exam questions are actually gonna be harder, at least I wanna say half of them, I made them actually harder than what you would actually get on any of the exams. So if you do pretty well on the practice exams, you're gonna be good to go. As far as the content, um, just be aware that uh, we're not gonna be able to dive into every sub objective uh, for the course, uh, you know, for one hour. Basically, this is a four to six hour um, objective that we're covering depending on the certification. Like Security Plus, this would be about two, two and a half hours. Uh, so just, just be aware. Now, you have the content. We're gonna do what I can to cover uh, the major areas. And there's practice questions. So let's go ahead and just get started. Now, what I did is at the beginning here, we have some review questions. I'm not gonna go through the review questions. I just put them in here for you to take a minute and maybe just see if this is sort of what you're expecting before you take the exam. Now I've been teaching Security Plus and CASP and, and other um, subjects such as CEH as well for quite a while. And what I try to do is I try to make the content harder than the, the materials per se that you're gonna get on the exam because that gives people that advantage to go in thinking it's harder and then they realize, wow, okay, well, this wasn't as bad as I thought. So again, this is here. Now, um, what I did is um, in the back, I have uh, the answers for you. So I just wanted to give you the same questions without the answers and then the questions with the answers so that you go back and review the content and basically be able to um, find out why that is the correct answer. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, uh, again, I warned everyone, there's a lot of terminology. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some terminology. We're going to go through the objectives. I'm going to point out where this fits into some of the exams. And then I have some demos we're going to go through as well. And I'll give you all the link to, for you to go back and practice on the demo site as well. Because on the exams, uh, a lot of it just comes down to not so much being a developer or a programmer or you know, having to uh, program, for example, um, some kind of uh, PKI environment or anything. It's more just understanding the basics. Now, the first thing is this three terms, um, really two, but it's part of the CIA triangle as it's known, the triad right here, confidentiality, integrity. Now availability is generally not covered or required to, to know for this part of the objective. Uh, it is of course on the exam, it's just not part of the encryption or cryptography part of the course. So just be aware. So we want to know what confidentiality is, integrity, key management, uh, steganography, uh, symmetric, and asymmetric. Now, I'm going to highlight this, uh, these two. We want to spend some good time on this. I, well, again, you know, we don't have a lot of time. But uh, in an hour, hour, and 10 minutes or so, I'm going to do what I can to cover this area because this is where most folks go wrong from what I've seen teaching these courses to government agencies, for example. Um, now, a lot of this is really simple. Um, and I, I tried to put the content as simple as I could. And I have a lot of details. Again, the content has more, I guess, content than it needs for, for example, most of the exams. But just be aware. We go through this, I'm gonna highlight the main areas, main points to know around definitions. Okay, and then we're gonna talk about digital signatures and why they're important. Uh, excuse me. And then non-repudiation and what exactly that means. So let's talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, for those that are familiar with IT security, this is sort of like the, the basics of the basics, right, for IT security. We have to be able to weigh each of these um, important aspects of the CIA triad. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let me put up the chat box here. I just want folks to, uh, if I can find it, hold on, there it is. Um, Okay, everybody hear me okay? Looks like someone said they lost audio. Um, yeah, I can hear you. I think then uh, Brandon said it and then I think he okay. popped out of the meeting. Perfect, yeah, okay. Um, He's back in. Brandon, can you hear us? Okay, right. so Brandon. the CIA yeah. triad. Okay, great, great, welcome back. Um, now, as far as... Um, is uh, okay let me just check the chat here yeah okay yeah i'm gonna give everybody my linkedin contact my blogs um also conferences i'll be speaking at this year i've got several i'm lined up for uh to be speaking at so hopefully i can uh connect with folks and help everybody out and i also point out courses on quick start as well that can help enable you to get you know, as knowledgeable and ready for the exams as possible. All right, now the CIA triad is a must. I'm not gonna cover this because this is sort of really another objective, but we wanna know these two terms for encryption. And again, a lot of this is um, really focused on um, the terminology. So what is confidentiality, right? It's the ability to ensure that information is only available to those that are, have access, right? That should have access, right? And then um, again, you know, that's just one term. And then as far as integrity, right? Um, ensuring trustworthiness and dependability of that information. Now, I wanna highlight this and I probably should have did this um, as well earlier. Now, one of the things that they really like to talk about on any of the exams that 
I've tested on around IT security is they sort of want to ask you, how do you provide integrity? And once again, hashing is one way to provide integrity. And we'll talk about some more aspects of that. So we must know integrity. We must know confidentiality as part of this objective. So just be aware there's a lot more to cover here. If you have any questions, let me know. Now, as far as um, integrity, one of the things that's the best practice is to have auditing set up. Now, a lot of companies are using lots of great programs and services that are either on-prem or in the cloud to help enable auditing. Now, confidentiality, right? We all know that if we don't protect our information properly, that that information could be intercepted, right? If we don't take the right steps in our IT security posture, this can be a big deal. Now, there's a term here that, again, um, a lot of folks, it's funny because this is a term that a lot of folks just never heard of. And I could see why. It's not something you see quite a bit of. It's called steganography. And what exactly is that? Well, this is really more of an art where someone will take a picture and they'll embed a message in the picture. Basically, you're taking these files and you're replacing bits and bytes, for example, um, of, of that picture and you're hiding it in that picture and in the bytes when you're saving it. So it's sort of uh, an interesting approach. So with steganography, or steganography, I should say, this will allow you to embed what's called a rootkit. And again, you want to highlight this again, you know, just be aware that a rootkit can be hidden in an image file through what? Through steganography. Another thing that um, you may want to be aware of, and there was actually a couple really interesting attacks and this still occurs, believe it or not. Facebook actually, when, when it really started taking off, was really um, pretty vulnerable to this, where you would click on a picture and someone, you know, you would think you would know this person or someone shares a picture. The worst thing on Facebook is just clicking these images from a friend of a friend of a friend, right? Never do that if you don't know the person because... This is something that can really get people if they don't have um, proper uh, antivirus and malware protection. For example, just about a week ago, no, two weeks ago, I have um, on my computer Norden Security. And um, again, for time purposes, I won't get into it, but if you go into here and you can look at the attacks that were stopped, I literally had an attack that was basically a, an image, you clicked on the image and it literally just stopped it. And this is on a website. So, and, and again, I was from a trusted source. You don't see that a lot, but it can happen. So just be aware, um, the highlights on the exam, we'll talk about steganography and basically how does an attacker um, or actually, you know, someone trying to send a message and keep it secure in plain sight. One thing about steganography is that it's usually in plain sight. And you have images that are going to have watermarks. Now, as far as cryptography, um, again, this is the practice of hiding information, right? You want to have it so that someone can intercept it and actually decipher it at least easy, right? You wanna have keys. For example, when we take plain text and we wanna send it out, right? We wanna be able to do what to that plain text? We wanna encrypt it. And, and again, we'll go through a quick whiteboard session here uh, as well, but basically just be aware that that's you know, what, it, what it's going to do. Now, 
when it comes to replacing plain text, right? What we want to do is replace it with what? With cipher text. So let me go ahead and get my browser up and let me go to a quick whiteboard. And I just want to point out, and I'm going to speed up as far as the content is concerned, because again, I want to highlight the main areas and then you have the content to study and um, be successful in this objective. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about here is this. We're going to want to um, have basically some way to send information from point A to point B. And if we don't pay attention, right, and if we send, for example, a plain text message to, uh, let me get my pen here one sec, okay. So for example, if we have a user wanting to send information from point A to point B, and let me get another box here actually. And again, this is not a full walkthrough, but just something to refresh your memory because again, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with this, but in case you're not, um, just be aware that what do we want to do? Oh, that's not what I want to do. I want my pen. Okay. We want to be able to, you know, again, send information from, you know, one user, let's say, um, I don't know, Sally to Frank, right? Now, again, we're going to want to take this information. The first thing we want to do is what? We're going to package this up in a message. And it's going to be part of a message. And again, we're going to put this in a message. And, and again, we could do this several different ways. But for time purposes, we just want to do a quick demo. And the first thing is, is this message is going to be what? We're going to put information in a document or whatever. It's going to be what? Plain text, right? So again, we want to go ahead and take this plain text and convert this over to what? To basically encrypt to an encrypted uh, text, right? To cryptographic text, right? And that's called what? Uh, basically, most exams will refer to this as cipher text. And then this is going over, let's say here, uh, uh, don't have the right symbol I want, but that's okay. So again, we'll just say that Again, this is just going through the internet. And then what's going to happen on the receiving end, right? We're going to go ahead and decipher that, right? So that's going to be cipher text that's going to be received. And then that'll be in what? Plain text. Now, again, there's a couple different ways that we could do this. And then we need to have what? We need to have our keys. And I'll get into key. So what we're going to do is take this diagram a couple steps at a time. We're going to go back to this and uh, walk through some of the um, sort of facets that we want to know for the exam. Also, too, um, one of the things to pay attention to, let me bring up my uh, PowerPoint here, is on the exam, uh, we want to be able to understand, for example, how a transaction can occur with the message. Like, how does plain text get converted over to ciphered text and what's involved? So we're going to go through all that. Now, when it comes to the um, ciphers, there's different types of ciphers. There's generally two common ones. There's also hybrids. You don't need to worry about that too much for the exams generally. But we want to know that there's block and stream ciphers. A block cipher is what? You're going to take a chunk of data known as a block and encrypt it. And then a stream cipher is a little different in the sense that it's going to take bits of data and transmit those bits of data at, at a time. So basically, it's, it's the difference between taking a block, which is going to have what? Many bits in it, and that's considered a block, whereas a stream is going to encrypt essentially all the bits. So for example, we'll talk about the block sizes, the bit sizes coming up. Uh, there's going to be some facets we want to know, 64, 128, 256. There's going to be some numbers we're going to definitely want to know. So we'll get into that as well. 
So why do we want to use a block versus a stream? Now, generally for performance purposes, stream is better. But again, um, these can have issues as well, especially if they're not implemented correctly. Now, for example, um, this is just an example where we're taking um, from point A to point B, we're taking basically text and converting it over, right? And then we have our algorithms. Now, what about key management? For us to send our data through a message or through public key encryption or PKI, we need to have what? We need to have keys, right? But before we get into the keys and the types of keys, we need to manage our keys, right? We have to be able to store our keys. We also need to know a lot of terms called CRLs, for example, revocation and um, private keys, public keys, right? What does all this really mean? So key management is really important. Now, encryption is the process of taking information and transforming it. Again, it's taking plain text and taking an algorithm called Cypher and making it unreadable without having the proper key. And again, we need to have a what? Public key and private keys. And I'll get into symmetric and asymmetric as well because I had warned folks, this is where a lot of people get confused on the exam, I think. But the reality is, is it's straightforward. It's just, a, to, to be fair and honest, sometimes a lot of this is nothing more than an exercise in memorization, right? Again, once you memorize it, most of you will never, ever really use this again, per se. It's not like you're going to be worried about it in a lot of your roles. Some of you may, but some of you probably won't either, right? But we do have to memorize some of some of these factoids, unfortunately, right? Now, most encryption schemes are based on algorithms, right? Oops, I just uh, went too fast. Okay, there it is. Now, how are we doing on time? I've got 4.30, okay, great. So I'm gonna be going to a couple uh, demos here and, um, all that and, and what I want to do is sort of take a second and um, just talk about algorithms. Now, remember I had time, and I won't go back to that slide just for time purposes, but remember on the definition page, we had symmetric and asymmetric. Well, this is where I want you to focus heavily on the exam to make sure you know the difference between the two. So the first thing is symmetric. What does symmetric mean generally, right? Well, it basically means what? It's the same, right? It's in. It's basically in alignment. Basically, we're taking one key, basically, and sharing that key. So the same key is going to encrypt and decrypt. So let's go back to my little page here. And if we had a symmetric key, well, give me one second. And uh, I want to just put up uh, probably right about, again, I, well, let me see how my resolution. So I'm at 125. Okay. Yeah, I was just worried. Again, you should be able to see this, right? It, it's at 125 for the view. So you should be good. Okay. So what I want to do now is um actually let's just do this um, okay so basically we could have symmetric and then we could have and again i never spell that right <laughs> Again, just uh, I always spell that incorrectly until I think about it. Now, um, we have symmetric and asymmetric. And, and then what we want to do is we want to talk about, for example, too, as far as keys as well, we also need to have what? Public keys and private keys as well. And I'll talk about, you know, who has a public key and private key in a second and how that all works. And then we need to get into some numbers as well. And we need to also talk about the workflow. So we'll be adding to this in a, a few minutes. 
Now let's go back to the terms here. Make sure we get this. Symmetric is the same. I always tell students think of symmetric as being the same and that'll help you all greatly on the exam. Because again, the term is not something we use every day. So don't try to make it more complex than it is. If you have the same key for, for the sender and the receiver, that is symmetric encryption. So basically the same key encrypts and decrypts. Again, it's very simple to remember, but you'll be surprised on the exam and you'll get symmetric, asymmetric as well. And then you'll be like, well, what is it, right? You know, again, don't make it more complex than it is. Now, one of the things that I just want you to pay attention to is on the exam, like, for example, I'll just talk about Security Plus because most of you generally from, again, I'm not sure what folks are going to focus on. Generally, probably Security Plus is one of the more common security exams out there. Uh, if I have uh, 100 students on the call, probably 40 or 50, you will take that first. It's an introductory cert. And then part of you will probably be taking the CISSP, which is, again, not as technical as Security Plus per se. And again, some folks will disagree, but again, that's another thought in itself. But again, um, and then like the real technical cert would be like the Cisco one. And then a certified ethical hacker could, could also be considered somewhat technical as well. But again, they're all technical. It's just which one is gonna really get deeper into the, the weeds, right? What do you have to memorize the most details for? And I will say, if you do take the Security Plus exam, you could expect anywhere from four to five questions, at least um, on symmetric and asymmetric cryptography, right? Again, just know this. So when we talk about symmetric key algorithms, this is the fastest and most efficient. Now, another area that I've noticed questions like to talk about is what kind of encryption would we want to use for disk encryption? Generally, you want to use symmetric, right? Because you want to take the same key from basically the storage array and then the encryption utility that you're using to have the same key. That's generally what's used. For example, when I was using at Brocade, we had the Brocade uh, encryption appliance. And again, that's what it used. It was pretty straightforward, same in, same out. Now, that's great if you're in an enterprise and you didn't give access to the public, right? not a big deal. Generally, you shouldn't have an issue. But what about if you get into like blockchain technology? You don't want to be using symmetric key encryption in blockchain or anything around email or anything in most cases. So we'll talk a little bit more about that if that you know, uh, permits. Uh, now, these are some other ciphers that are out there. And this is the hardest part, you know, knowing not only symmetric and asymmetric terms, but knowing the ciphers. This just derails so many students from passing these exams. This page and this other page we'll get to right here. Uh, like I said, on the Security Plus, expect at least five or six questions, probably more than that on the uh, five, uh, 500 series exam, it, it again, trying to memorize AES versus DES, but also to, you know, understanding, for example, where this all really fits in and why you want to use it. So let's talk about some of these. Now, for time purposes, I need to, to pick up the pace a little bit. I, I have a demo I want to get to, and I want to review the objectives on a couple of the exams and point out, um, you know, what we just covered basically. Now, DES. This is a block cipher. And again, I, I don't you know, want to scare anybody from taking the exams because, again, this is an exercise in memorization. OK, what on the exams, right, no matter which one you take, you have to know some of these numbers. 
DES, okay, first of all, isn't really used anymore, but you'll likely see some of the numbers. So for example, you see the block size, right? But don't get confused between the key size, right? And the block size. Now, for the longest time, I, you know, sometimes I'm probably not the best at memorizing stuff because that's just me. But over time, I got better at it. Now, I'd recommend when you're taking the exam to try to find a way. And, and again, I'll share some more resources where we go through some tips on that. But basically, just try to remember whatever works for you, like the number of bits and, and, and how big the key size is. This is, again, going to take some time. Try to write it out in a chart or a sentence or whatever. And, and when you take the exam, you'll have this in a manner that can make sense. Okay. Now, there's some other ciphers out there that are used. You don't really probably need to know. I've not seen any exam like talk about who invented what, um, except for on the CISSP, there was, again, one question um, that talked about one of the asymmetric ciphers but and who created it, but in reality, you don't need to worry about that. You have bigger things to worry about. But what I want to point out is on any of the exams, you need to know what these ciphers are, but also know the key sizes and the bit size. This is, again, I don't have any, and there's a chart out there that um, uh, I'll try to pull up, or if you connect up with me, I can also provide that. But basically, um, I would recommend you spend some time on these. Uh, I'd love to spend more time on it, but like I had warned folks, to get through these slides is typically anywhere from two and a half to five hours, depending on the exam and the details that you're going to be tested on. Now, AES has a 128-bit block size. Now, here, like I said, you could see where we go with this. Try to do your best to not confuse bit size and key sizes. I generally like to tell folks the block size is what that has the bits in it. Basically, how, how can you compress the bits basically in that block, right? Now, the key sizes are different. The key sizes are what? That's going to be um, the size of the cryptographic means that you're going to be part that's part of the algorithm that's going to have the key sizes that are going to be sent from point a to point b this is basically the um sort of like the file sizes in in its own sort of right but not totally i'll get to that in a second again um rc4 this is one you want to know um, most widely used stream cipher so for example, if you want to have a mobile device, what would be the protocol you'd want to use? Well, generally, again, we could use SSL, TLS, WEP. Um, there's also um, you know, WEP2 Enterprise, right? There's a lot of others. These are just some examples. But basically, um, what would you use with these protocols? RC4 and RC5 basically would be sort of what you would want to use. Again, don't get confused between Blowfish and, you know, all these other names that are out there, right? AES, DES. If you see anything on mobile, it's probably going to be RC4, RC5. Again, I'd love to talk more about it for time purposes, but we just don't have that time. Now, what, here's a term that, to, to be honest, again, a lot of people just never heard of this. Um, it is called, and I'll just highlight it in red to make sure you sort of pay attention to it. What is a one-time pad? This is an encryption algorithm, which essentially plain text is combined with a secret random key and is only as long as a plain text that's used typically um, once. So basically you're taking plain text and a random key and you're using it once. Basically, 
I like to call this a one-use encryption key. That's really what it is. Now, this is really good, especially like, for example, if you've used soft tokens. Um, for example, RSA, if anybody's used like, uh, I know like a lot of companies will dish out like, uh, remember the secure IDs? It's very similar to that. You'll get a one-time encryption key and you have what? You have 30 seconds or a minute to use it. And then guess what? That key is, is no longer good. That random key is dead. That's basically a one-time pad. If you've had like an enterprise RSA token, whether a hard token or a soft token, pretty much what you're using. Okay, let's talk about asymmetric. And that's where my picture isn't showing up there. Uh, okay, check into that. Now, as far as um, cryptography, again, um, we have asymmetric, right? So I remember we had symmetric and now we have asymmetric. Now this was invented by Diffie and Hellman in 1976. And again, it tells you how long ago, even before my time in IT, like I had warned you, right? This stuff really hasn't changed a whole lot in the last, you know, 30 years in IT, pretty much I've been uh, been in. So again, sometimes people make it harder than it is. There's a lot to cover, but again, it's been around and it's been the same for a long time. Now, I did want to point out uh, one thing. For example, the main difference is that, let me go back to my diagram here. So with a symmetric key, right, we're going to have, uh, let me do this a little bit more logically. All right, so what I'm going to do is call this key A. Now, if I have symmetric um, encryption, right, I'm going to have the same key at the sender and the receiver, right, basically. However, let's say I have... weird. There it is. Looked like it dropped out on me. So let's say I have key A here, but over here, I have another key. I'm going to call this key B. So if we have symmetric encryption, let me change my color, right? Then symmetric encryption tells me what? I have the same key on the sender and then I have the, uh, the same key on the receiver, right? Now, if I have asymmetric, guess what? I have a different key here and a different key there, right? Basically, I have a public key and a private key, right? That's really what it comes down to. Okay, let's go over here and go back to the slides. So again, it's not too hard if you break it down a little at a time. Now, when we talk about secure communications, we want to realize that we have unique P key pairs. And again, right, asymmetric encryption has what? Public keys and private keys. Symmetric encryption has what? One key. And that's basically called the encryption key. There's no real fancy name for it. Basically, um, it's called a symmetric key or just, just the encryption key. And here's an example of how it works. And here's a comparison um, between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Uh, now, I like this. This is a really good study chart, or, or I guess I call it a chart or table, whatever you want to call it, between symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, and asymmetric encryption, right? So on the left, down the bottom versus the right, like I said, if you take any of the security exams, they really like to test your knowledge on identifying which one is symmetric and which one is asymmetric. Some of the questions, for example, will have multiple choice questions and will say, select two, which, one, which ones are symmetric encryption. Now I call it symmetric because I like to pronounce it um, hard because sometimes uh, with my Bostonian and Florida accent, it's a little confusing because asymmetric 
might sound like symmetric. So that's why I say it a little bit different than the way it should be. But I just want to make sure when I say symmetric, people understand it is not asymmetric. OK, so just want to point that out. Now, what I'd like you to do is before you take the exam, do some um, flashcards or just try to memorize these. Because again, on any of these exams, you'll get a couple of these questions that are going to just try to get you on which one is a symmetric versus asymmetric encryption um, basically approach, right? Which one is the right method to use for the situation? Again, there's no easy way to memorize this. I, I wish I had an easy way. Sometimes you just gotta draw it out or write it down and try to memorize it before you go in, right? Now, as far as asymmetric ciphers, again, these are very common. RSA, Diffie-Hellman, um, which one was the first one, right? We know which one that is, Diffie-Hellman. Don't get confused between RSA. RSA, 1977. When was Diffie-Hellman created? Let's go back and take a look. 1970 what? Before my time, right? 1976. Again, expect on the exam which to know which one was the first algorithm to be used or proposed or whatever they say on the exam, right? Diffie-Hellman was the first. RSA was not the first. Okay. PGP, pretty good privacy, right? Very commonly used. Okay, RSA is still widely used. It is, again, asymmetric. Diffie-Hellman. <coughs> now, this is qu used quite a bit with SSH, so try to keep that in the back of your head. ECC is, elect uh, I'm sorry, Elliptical curve cryptography. And let me get some water. Okay. And this is an approach to public key cryptography. Now, a lot of the popular blockchains use this form of cryptography, for example. Most of the common ones use this. So ECC is widely used in the blockchain arena, for example. Now, PGP. This is peer-to-peer. -peer. And again, this is also used occasionally some of the blockchains as well as a peer-to-peer -peer protocol um, because again, it's really um, lightweight and can be used as well openly, freely. There's no crazy licensing, right? Digital signatures. Now, a digital signature provides integrity and non-repudiation. Why do we want to have a digital signature? Um, for those folks that are in the US military or even some of the other militaries, or I, I haven't seen too many, um, uh, for example, uh, non-governmental agencies use, for example, what's called a CAC card with basically PKI or public key encryption infrastructure set up. But basically, again, you need a signature, you add that signature to your email, and you send it validating that it is you that sent the email. Here's an example of how it all works. Now, what is non-repudiation? This is a term that sometimes I think uh, can get confusing to some folks, especially like if English is not your primary language, some of these terms can be really confusing because it's just not something that is widely used, right? Or can correlate to like a term um, in um, other languages. Like for example, uh, my wife is from Peru, speaks Spanish and, and uh, Portuguese. And you know, some of these terms just don't correlate, right? Okay, now non-repudiation. What is, why do we want it? Well, again, we wanna be able to prove that it is us and we wanna make sure that the receiver says, well, it wasn't you. In other words, we wanna validate that I am who I am, right? And it can't be sort of taken back, right? I like to call this basically um, 
you know, the DNA, right, of the message. In other words, it's your DNA. Like, for example, every one of us has a unique DNA, right, as a human being. And that DNA is very unique. And the chances of that DNA being basically replicated by another person is, you know, literally in the billions of, you know, chance possibility that that could be the same exact DNA pattern, right? Very, very limited. So this is a way that you provide essentially like your way of proving it is you and only you. Um, okay. Now here's an example of how this would work. Again, I'll let you trace that out in your mind. Okay. Hashing. What is hashing? Well, hashing is what, and, and again, these are some term, terms you want to use. Hashing is basically a function where we take basically an input and we get an output that is deterministic. So let's go ahead and just, instead of me covering the slide, let me go ahead and go to a demo. Now, I want to put this link um, in, in the chat box before I forget. This is a really nice demo that was provided um, by this Mr. Anders um, person. Uh, and I don't know, um, again, uh, much else about it, but it's available for anyone to go to. There's no cost, no sign up. It's a great demo. Now it's called the blockchain demo, but what it does is it actually just shows you hashing like as easily as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hello world, right? We all know what hello world is. That's basically as basic as we get for demo applications in the development world, right? A web app, whatever. So I'm gonna put in hello world. So I have an input of hello world, right? And I have a hash that is going to have a specific output. As you see, hello world has, for example, DE9 as the last three digits and B9 as the first two. And then everything else, I'm not gonna read it out, but you can see that it's the same hash, right? In other words, it's going to be the same hash when I put hello world. But what about if I take out the D? Well, guess what? My hash changes. If I put in a D, guess what happens? I get the same exact output from the same input. If I add a one, guess what? Everything changes again. This is a way to get an output from the same input every time. This is called deterministic. So I'm gonna put this in the chat for folks to go to. And I did that already, good, okay, I just wanna double check. And uh, let me see if there's any questions. Okay, good so far. All right, so, so let's go ahead and take this one more notch. Well, what about if, um, again, if we're taking something and we wanna add another variable to up the ante to our deterministic um, basically hashing algorithm, well, what we could do is basically add what's called a nonce. Well, if I add a nonce, basically guess what happens? That hash will change. But again, if I add the same thing back or whatever it was, I forgot, I didn't even pay attention, I just took it out. Uh, again, you could see that Yep, there it is, seven, two, six, or eight, okay. So you can see that it's five A. If I take out the eight, guess what happens? That changes, put back in the eight, put back the eight, it's back to where it was. Now, what about the block? If I change the block to two, guess what? The hash changes. So if I change any, any of these inputs, I add data to the message, let's say, guess what? I have three different ways to change the output, the block, the knots, and the data. And this is how the encryption algorithms are actually making things harder to decipher. So again, the nice demo you could play around with for time purposes, this, you know, again, I'll leave it up to you to, to check it out. How does a blockchain actually work? How does the hashing work in a blockchain? Again, a good little lesson for you to practice on hashing. All right. 
Now there's two characteristics of a hash. The first is it's one way. The second is it is fixed length. In other words, it's always going to be one way. I have the same input, it'll be the same output. I can't change the output though and expect the same input. That's the beauty of a hash. Again, if I change the input, the output will be the same. But if I try to change the output, guess what? We have a problem, Houston. When we look at the fixed length, it's always going to be the same length. In other words, it's not going to be 256 one minute and then 128 the next, right? It's always going to be the same output. Okay, so I did the hashing demo. We'll go ahead and move on. How are we doing time? Wow, okay. So what I want to do now is I want to point out a few more slides. I'm going to take an extra five or eight minutes, if that's okay. And I just want to cover a few more things to make sure we're fully enabled. But one of the things I want to cover uh, importantly is uh, coming up here. And as you see, I've got everything in here. Uh, again, this is talking about some of the important aspects. A lot of protocols. Now, these protocols will probably be very easy because, again, most of you probably have a networking background. But we want to know this for the exam. I'm going to skip over this for time purposes. And let's go over here to PKI. Now, some terms here that folks will want to know. PKI, public key infrastructure. We want to know what a certificate authority is, a key escrow, a CRL, and what trust models are. PKI is used for what? It is used to verify and authenticate each party in a transaction. Now, PKI is based on what scheme? It is asymmetric. They love, I swear, every subject matter expert that designs these security exams will ask you about what PKI is. Is it symmetric or asymmetric, right? Just expect that question. Now, Certificates are based off of what standard? X509. Remember that number. You will see it again, guaranteed on any exam. However, the question will probably be a little bit more complex than just saying what standard. They'll talk about what X509 is and what does it contain. So sometimes they, I like to call it, because again, some, sometimes when they de develop these questions, they don't want to make it so that you go the most direct route. They make it so that you have to go have a layover and you have to think about it, right? All right, now here's, again, if you haven't actually used uh, any kind of PKI or uh, any kind of email messaging and pay attention to what you're doing, right? You may not know these files. So for example, certificates are what files? They're .cer files. However, a private certificate is what type of file? So highlight that as well in your documentation. Make sure you know these. OK, um, a wild card certificate is what? Why is it used for? The goal is, is to make your life easier as a certificate manager as a security manager, right? You don't want to have wild cards for everything, but if you have, for example, traffic coming from a specific domain and you know that the subdomain is probably going to be okay, then, you know, instead of going out and getting a whole bunch of um, infrastructure set up, you just go ahead and use a wild card. This is the process to get a basically a um, certificate authority set up. Some terms you wanna know, like what a CSR is, I'll leave it up to you to get into that. 
some more information uh, as well. One of the terms that they like to use is Web of Trust. Uh, if you take any CompTIA exam, you're going to see that again, more than likely once or twice. Some other terms, OK. Now, I provided you some review questions with and without answers. For example, an administrator needs to submit a new CSR to a certificate authority. For example, which what is the first step you'd want to do? Well, you need to generate what? A private key based on RSA, for example. Again, know what a CSR does. Which of the following encrypts data as a single bit at a time? Right? Instead of instead of what? Blocks, right? It's a single bit. Remember, bits are in blocks. Blocks are not in bits. Try to remember this the best you can because they love asking questions similar to this. Stream cipher. OK, remember we talked about hashing. The same output will result basically because of what? The same input. Now, this is where the question is a little bit tricky. You got to read it. But basically, they're asking you if you provide the same input and you, you should get what? The same output. That is what? That is hashing, right? If we want to verify data integrity, what is the best answer here? SHA. Why? Because it's more secure compared to these, right? What is a digital signature, right? Remember, I called the digital signature what? Similar to DNA, right? It's something that we have. It's in our possession. Only us can actually send it. That's assuming it's properly implemented. <laughs> it's another story, right? So for example, this one here, a company needs to re uh, receive data that contains PII data, so personal identifiable information. What would they what do they want to use to transmit that data and also provide data at rest? So basically we need two different protocols here because one protocol will not handle it all, right? SSH and PGP or CPG. Now it could also be what? other options depending on what they provide. So this is where we need to pay attention to what we're trying to do. SSH, right? We're all familiar with SSH, commonly used. If you're going to access data, like on a virtual machine, you're going to use SSH. Again, PGP is pretty good privacy. And let's see, why do we want to have a security audit? And, and uh, what are we looking for? And basically, this is giving you an example of finding some graphics or photos and trying to determine, you know, is, is there a vulnerability with steganography? Why do we want to deploy a wildcard, right? We know why. Basically, to reduce the burden. Salting, I didn't talk about salting for time purposes, but... Salting is a way that we could basically um, maintain, for example, our password structure, but basically add a little bit extra before we hash it. It's very similar to like a nonce in blockchain. Again, nothing new here. We just call it something different depending on the technology, right? Nothing more than that. Okay, now for time purposes, uh, again, um, Quick Start does have numerous security and security certification courses to help you prepare in your IT journey from CCNA uh, to CompTIA Security Plus to CEH to, to Security and Office 365 and on and on and on, right? A lot of great options. I encourage you to take advantage of whatever services you have available. Uh, or can subscribe to, definitely take a look at that. With that said, if there's any questions, 
please feel free to reach out and um, let me know. I'll hold off a minute before uh, we break off. And I'll let the moderator explain about the recordings uh, as well uh, in the meantime. Yeah, everyone. So uh, once the session is complete, we will send you guys the recording of this webinar. And Joseph, thank you very much for a wonderful training session. Yes, yeah, thank you. And also uh, note, um, go ahead and check out the objectives for the exam or objectives, uh, you know, the exam objectives for whatever exam that you're going to take. This is the CEH. This is Security Plus, for example. And uh, that is another exam somehow I left up there. But basically, again, the two more common ones like Security Plus, CEH. Uh, CISSP has objectives that are defined as well. For example, cryptography and PKI is 12% of the Security Plus exam. On the CEH exam, we could see that cryptography is listed here under security. This is 25% of the exam. Now, it doesn't break down what part of the 25% cryptography is, but again, it's it's still quite a bit. And also too, um, as part of the security, uh, uh, this one here, number five procedures, it's listed again, 20%. So cryptography is listed at least once or several times based on the exam that you're going to take. So I encourage you to go back and check it out. Whatever you're going to look at, spend some time to get yourself enabled. Um, yeah, so the webinar, um, uh, for example, was clearly um, designed for an hour. However, I gave you literally what I would cover in two and a half to about four hours of time, depending on the certification. So yeah, um, as far as that, um, the recording will be available. Um, I'm not sure how the slide deck would work, but I'll leave that up to Quick Start to uh, determine that. Right, uh, so the best thing in, to tackle with that will be to have another session on it since the sides were too much. Right, and we will look into it. Right, so Joseph, there are two more questions. Uh, one yes. is from Will Mitchell. Uh, it says, is this webinar able to be used for CompTIA Security Plus CEUs? Yes, yeah. So um, as far as Security Plus, this is actually um, pretty much the content I would use for Security Plus, the new exam, the 500 series. So yes, this is exactly um, this objective right here. Let me go back here. This is literally, as you see, cryptography and PKI. This, what we covered today would be 12% of the exam. And this is pretty much with the exception of probably another 10, 12 slides, all the objective I would cover. So, so yes, good question. Right, and we um, have... and um, as far as yes, so uh, so the question from a look like Will Mitchell, can we use this for continuing ed units? Absolutely. For those folks that are not familiar with CEUs, when you get a plus certification with CompTIA, you need to have continuing ed. This will count for one hour, so definitely place the link save the link and take a snapshot of the webinar and just add it to your CEU units in the CompTIA portal. If you have any questions, well, reach out to me. I'm happy to walk you through that uh, as well. Right, great. Uh, and you have, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to support at quickstart.com or marketing at quickstart.com. Exactly. So thank you very much, Joe. Uh, and uh, it was a lovely training session and we guys will get back to you with the recording and uh, with our emails. Right? Have a good day, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone. Goodbye.